13. We're on 13, but I want to go back and oh, okay. aim you this way. 2 and 12, we ended up in the truth is safety. Outside the truth are the forces of hell itself. God tries to save everyone in the world. 1 John 2 and 2 says that Christ died for all men. But not all men will be saved, will they? Some just won't be. And some of God's people that are saved don't want to go the easy route. They have to be beat over the head. They have to, they have to go through train wrecks and, and terrible uh, experiences in life before they realize that God is not trying to do anything uh, that's going to keep them from having fun. God tries to uh, guide you down the easy path of life. Now, we have the eternal choice of God in 1 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 13. Pretty soon we're going to be finished with this book. Okay. 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 You call okay. To Dio Pantote Perry Imon Adelphoi Aga Pavanoi Pipo Kiryu, Kote, Pilato, Imas, Ho, Theos, Arparke, Ace, Soterion, N, Hagiasmo, Numatos, Kai, Piste, Alethias. All right, now let's go back to. We've got a lot, a lot of cross references. 1 Corinthians 2 and 7, Ephesians 1 and 4, 2 Timothy 1 and 9, Romans uh, 8 and verse 23 and 11 and 16, 1 Corinthians 15 and 20 and verse 23 and 16 and verse 5, Philippians 1 uh, 22, Hebrews 11 25, 2 Thessalonians 1 and 3, uh, just 1 Peter 1 and 5. And one and two in first Peter. These are all cross references to this verse right here. How do textual critics, people that study the science of textual criticism, and I'm not talking about people that don't believe in the Bible. How do they study the Word of God and find out if there's something in there that might be bogus somewhere. It might be a piece or a passage of Scripture that might not have been there originally. How do they do it? Look at the Greek. Well, they look at the Greek. Well, they look at the Greek, but there are some Greek manuscripts that aren't very good. Too. Mm-hmm. Texas Receptus is one of the great misnomers. <laughs> uh, well, the Bible agrees, doesn't it? Right. You can't take a piece of scripture out of the Bible and try to make it disagree with any part of the other part of the Bible, any of the other Bible, because if it does, there's something wrong. Because God's word is God breathed in it. It's inspired. Now, we've studied this. Uh, some of you haven't been in my class, probably you haven't been in my class at all. We've studied different books of the Bible. We studied the Gospel of John. Uh, book of Revelation, First and Second Peter, and the Book of Jude, and First and Second Thessalonians. Now, in the Gospel of John, in the Book of Revelation, and these other books, there are very few scriptures that are were not there. But the transmission of the Bible, the New Testament especially, not the Old Testament. The Old Testament, uh, every Hebrew scribe, when he finished his work copying a text, book of Isaiah or whatever book in the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, when he gets numbered, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, whatever, he copied. 
They took and they counted, they read it all, and they compared it to the known text, and they compared it, and it would not have a seal of approval on it. If there was one error in it, they did not correct it, they destroyed the text. So, in the Old Testament, we don't have any problems with discrepancies in text. But in the New Testament, the New Testament, it was, and by the way, the New Testament is just as valid as the Old Testament. There's nothing different between them. But the New Testament was given to us by inspiration, just like the Old Testament. But it went from church to church. The book of Ephesians, for instance. If you look and go and turn, how many of you got a Bible? All right, you have a Bible. Do you have a Bible with you, Charles? What kind of a Bible is it? An IV. An IV. Would you turn to the book of Ephesians there, and uh, the first chapter, and right there where it says uh, to the church in Ephesus, what does it have in Ephesus there? Does it have that in brackets? No, it has a, um, a superscript. It says. Um, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, to the saints mm -hmm. in Ephesus. Okay, in Ephesus there. What does it say about in Ephesus? Say anything about it. Well, there's a Mind superscript it. and it says, some early manuscripts do not have in Ephesus. All right, because it wasn't the Ephesian letter originally. Now, that was copied in there someplace later on. That was not in, the, in that text. John 758 through 811. Mm -hmm. You've heard many preachers preach on those verses, but those were not in the Bible beyond 800 A.D. Is that shocking? We see some of the things. They were copied. The Bibles were copied, and they were copied by hand. Okay? In the New Testament, the, what we call the, no, what we call the official church from 350 A.D. on down to, to the Protestant Reformation fault every other religion that existed. And they would only accept what they had as their Bible. All of these other people uh, were copying scriptures. All the Baptists were copying scriptures. Okay, right and left. Every Baptist preacher, if he had a Bible at all, he had to memorize Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and all the Psalms. That was one of the things for his part of a Baptist pastor. But if he had any at all, he copied it in his own handwriting. And if he added an illustration someplace or something, he copied that right the same way. And they copied them in Greek. From about 300 and, uh, well, let's say 400 A.D. on, the Catholic Church would not let any, any Bibles be copied in the Catholic Church or even outside the Catholic Church as far as they had control of in anything but Latin because the common man could not read Latin so the common man wouldn't have the Bible in his hands. The Greeks, uh, the, the, the Baptists at that time were still copying the scriptures in, in Greek but they had to hide with it. And sometimes when they copy the scriptures they might make a mistake. Well, about 1700 to 1800 people started studying the text of the New Testament and they had found, by that time, they had found some really old Bibles they found that there were discrepancies in many of the old Bibles. Now, the King James Bible was written, uh, are, are written when? What period of time? What? 1611. Okay, 1611. Well, the King James Version was based upon the Latin Vulgate and the Texas Receptus. Now, don't be fooled by the name Texas Receptus. The word Texas Receptus is Latin. It means to receive text. It wasn't received from God. That was an advertisement scheme by uh, Stevens and his people that, that, that put out the first printed Greek New Testament that was widespread. Well, that was not an original Greek manuscript that they printed. It came from the Latin Vulgate. Now, who, who translated the Latin Vulgate? Where did it come from? Catholic, maybe. Well, it came from a Catholic priest. His name was Jerome, and I, they say later he became a pope. 
And he was a Bethlehem, and he just gathered up a whole lot of Greek manuscripts and started copying everything. He didn't discriminate what he thought might have been real or wasn't real, and this was around 400 A.D. He just grabbed up everything and just started copying everything in. Some of the things that he copied in Latin Vulgate didn't make any sense whatsoever, especially in the book of Revelation. Well, when they translated Textus Receptus, or wrote, or printed Textus Receptus, or Stephen's text of the Greek New Testament, it was not translated from Greek at all. It was not copied from Greek. It was copied, it was translated from Latin Vulgate back into Greek by these scholars that they had there. So they copied all of the mistakes in the Latin Vulgate to copy them into the received text or text or receptus. We have a, a great body of people out today, uh, only, they, they King James only, and all this kind of stuff. Just King James only, text or receptus only. There's not a scholar among them. If they were, if there were, they wouldn't believe that. Because that is probably one of the most corrupt texts that you, well, it is the most corrupt text that you could possibly lay your hands on. Well, God's holy word is holy. These people started studying. Westcott and Hort were some of the people. Uh, later on, um, uh, there were other groups of people that were studying like that do what they call textual criticism. Today, in your Nestle Allen text or, or your, uh, your Nestle text that you can buy at any Bible bookstore just about, is so close to the original autographs that Paul signed and Mark signed, Matthew, Luke. Because they have gone back and they've traced the families of manuscripts. They take, tra tra traced where all of these bogus things came. They can find out what family of manuscripts it came from, where, what century, almost sometimes to the month and the day and the year where it began. And so what we have and what we're studying here tonight is those untainted manuscripts, but there are many of them out there that aren't, especially the translations. I just want you to be aware of that, okay? But what we're studying has been gone over with a magnifying glass, so to speak, and every word in it, and you'll read that. But every now and then I just throw this out, especially when I have new students and everything, and some of the older ones will ask, about the, t the text of the New Testament. The text of the New Testament is now just as sound as the text of the Old Testament because it has been gone over with a fine tooth comb with a magnifying glass, so to speak. Many people uh, uh, ask me about the Book of Enoch. Our preacher, a renowned preacher here, preached a while back that the Book of Enoch was in the uh, Apocrypha. It's not. The book of Enoch was in the Septuagint for hundreds of years. And the book of Enoch was lost for many years. And I wish that they would take the book of Enoch and completely compare it and do a textual criticism on it so we would know or have a good idea of what was inspired and what wasn't there, like they have done all of the books of the New Testament. Uh, John? Uh, it's not in the Bible, right? No, Enoch the book of Enoch is not in the Bible at all. It was originally at one time. It was in the Septuagint and the Hebrews, the, the Dead Sea Scrolls, one of the, the books that they copied more than anything else, the Essenes, the Qumranians, was the Book of Enoch. And the Book of Enoch disappeared from about 300 A.D. till I think, 19, basically 1958. That's when the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered again. They had been discovered around eight or 900 A.D. And somebody took part of the Book of Enoch and, and they had it in, in a, a library in Egypt. Is this interesting to you? Yeah. All right. Jim, I wanted to ask a question. Yes. I don't want to change the subject, but it, it's not really changing the subject. But like in uh, King James, mm -hmm. they still have 1 John 5, 7, oh, yeah. three witnesses in heaven. Yeah. And most other like the NIV and all these other different, they eliminated that scripture. It wasn't eliminated because it wasn't ever there. Yeah, but King James put it in there because they went from the Latin Vulgate. It was not in any of the old manuscripts at all, no. But 
but Jerome had copied it into the Latin Vulgate. Yeah, I, I but was, it was in none of the old spirit manuscripts at all. I was told there was original manuscripts by four different groups, mm -hmm. and there's three little groups that they translated most of these other Bibles from, mm -hmm. but the King James came from the big group, which had that in it. King James came from the Latin Vulgate. Oh, yeah. so that's not even <laughs> King James also was a very colored translation because King James says, do not translate anything that would be contrary to the doctrines of the church of England in it or I'll kill you. That's why we have the word baptism instead of dipping and we have the word church instead of assembly. Do you have something for it? Yeah. Uh, to a conscientious Christian who wants to pursue truth mm -hmm. and live a holy and godly life, mm -hmm. it behooves him to know the history of the scriptures. Mm -hmm. Because you have many people, I think there are many people out there preaching, and, and I get the feeling they're not up on what they ought to be up on in order to be leading somebody else. It's almost like the blind leading the blind. Yes, it is. That's what, that's what the, the Lord said himself. Blind leading the blind, both of them fall in the ditch, don't they? In that grammar that I wrote there, yes. the first two written things, and don't look at the Greek before you go in there and read the history of the text of the New Testament and the history of the Greek language. That's very, very important because I taught a lot about what I just taught tonight. So do I have to take some history classes now? I mean, I'm well, you're getting all of it right here. I'm working more now than I ever did when I was working. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and well, I'm you're going to get it all in this class. All right, thank you. You're going to get it all here. But I, I like to go through there every now and then because I get new people, and it's good for you and others that have been here for a long time to get refreshed on it also. He may, yes, Mark. They, uh, there was a thing on the news on the radio this morning. They're trying to get the Bible brought into college as a history book. Not religion, so anybody could scream about it, but to study it as history because we need it. Yeah. Well, the Bible is accurate history. The Bible is accurate history. If the scientists would just look and find out how God created things, if they just looked that way, and they never would have gone wrong, the, church, uh, the, the, the Catholic Church said that the earth was flat. If they would have read the Bible, they would have known it wasn't flat. Christopher Columbus wouldn't have had to go off there where the beasties and dragons were. All right? People have gone away from the God's Word. That's why they've become ignorant. And the Catholic Church led the whole world into the Dark Ages. Him ace. We, and actually it should start with that little weak adversity conjunction there, day. And we, or moreover we ought, O Philobin. First person plural. Look at that. Ophelomen, first person plural, we ought, present indicative active, we ought always, it's present tense, an indicative mode, an active voice, look at that. Present tense is something that's going on right now. Isn't it? Mm -hmm. Indicative mode is what? Is a flat statement of fact that something is true. Active voice is the person is acting. All right, the subject is acting for himself. All right. Eucharistē. Here we have something also. We ought Eucharistē. We have the word kara right here, or charis. All right? And we have the word you in the front of it. You, in Greek, that little prefix means what? Euphony. The word euphony is a Greek word, but it's been brought over into the English language to mean what? Phone means what? Sound. Sound. Okay, you. Good sound. Greeks change the letter when they're writing here. They would change letters sometimes for euphony. Remember? When, it, when it's kata, sometimes it's cough or caught. They'll change it like that so it'll sound smooth with the next word. It'll just flow. All right? Euphony. Now, eucharistain means good grace. It means to give thanks. It means to be thankful. 
And it's present, infinitive, active also. Present tense, infinitive, and it's active. What's an infinitive? That's one of them continuing things, isn't it? Something that goes on. All right? So we ought always to give thanks, to be thankful, to be full of thanks to the you. All right? Daily singular masculine, that word to there. To. That's a definite article. Do you see how that definite article agrees with that noun behind it? That noun would be theos. Whole theos. And then it would be in genitive oblique, two theos. Two theo. Two. Tau, omicron, ypsilon. Okay? Now we have T-O. In locative, instrumental, mental, and dative cases, you will have the to, theo. All right. Let me write this down. Whole, and then two, two, to, to, to. All right. See, you have this nominative, nominative, genitive, oblique, blocking, instrumental, dating, and then we have accusative and vocative. Accusative. And vocative. All right. <clears throat> Eight cases. Now here, as we're reviewing a little grammar as we go, we ought to give thanks to God. To God. Native case. To or for God. To Him for His glory. Right. And then pon tote, that little adverb there. Pon tote. That means always. Give thanks to God always. Present indicative active, present infinitive active, and now we have peri. The word peri. Peri. That's concerning or around. When you have a peri car. Uh, Pericardia infection. What do you have an infection around your heart? All right. And then concerning e, that little preposition. Then, you, then we have a genitive plural, second person pronoun. That but word he moaned there. And then Adelphoi. Delphoi. That's the word for brothers. Brothers. That's Bacchity. All right? Bacchity. Bacchity. Plural. Masculine. And then we have a beautiful word here. Agapemonoi. It comes from agapeo. How have you heard of that word agape? All right. Agape is what? That means godly love. That's a sacrificial love. That's a give your life for love. And and I, I read a, a, a commentary on Greek one time that this guy was all wet. He said, I don't believe. He said, I can prove that the word agapeo is not always godly love because sometimes it's used in the Bible of the Pharisees and the scribes. He said, well, they loved the praise of men more than they did God. Well, I have no problem with that. They gave their lives for the praise of men rather than the love of God. Because they gave their souls for the praise of men rather than the love of God. It's a sacrificial love. They sacrificed their eternal life for the praise of mankind. It was sacrificial, all right, but it was the wrong kind of sacrifice. Still, the word agapeo means their sacrifice. There are several words for love in Greek. And this one here, having been loved, perfect participle passive, nominally plural masculine. All right. Having been loved, brothers, having been loved. How did God love? This is a perfect participle. Perfect tense means what? What kind of tense is that? Hmm? What? Perfect. 
It means completed action. Completed action. You know, Jesus Christ loved man so much, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life, everlasting life. For God so loved the world. That happened point time. Punctiliar action. One time it happened. All right? That's what you asked me a little earlier, God. Punctiliar action. When did that take place? When did Jesus become, when did Jehovah become flesh? If the time calendar was correct, which it actually isn't. It was John 1.14. John 1.14. Thank you, brother. For the word, the Jehovah flesh became. That was at the birth of Jesus. All right? And that would have been actually A.D. 0. That's when he was born. And when did he die? When did he show that completed, perfect... 33. A.D. 33, which is, you know, I, I keep saying this isn't the exact date, but that was the way it was, and then they found out there was a mistake in it, but we just leave it like it is, all right? A.D. means the year of our Lord. That's what it means, on a domino. B.C. means before Christ. Is, That's before Christ became flesh. What is the A.D.? What is the word the D represent? Domino. The domino. year of our Lord. Annus Domino. Annus Domino. The year of our Lord. Yeah. Domino. All right. It's Latin. It means the year of our Lord. That's when, he, that's when God became flesh and dwelt among us. All right. This is beautiful. Now, the Bible is so beautiful. It has all the tenses, all the modes and everything perfectly theologically correct. Uh, Brother Mike, you asked me earlier in the class, he said, what is the best translation, the best study Bible you can have? I said, well, outside of mine, I said, Spiral Zodiotes, Hebrew and Greek study Bible. It's not perfect, but it's the next best thing to mine. Mine's the best. You know why? Because it's theologically correct according to me. <laughs> I did it. Everything that all of the... Uh, Commentaries, all of the cross references, and everything are theologically and textually correct, at least according to me. So that would be the best one for me, and they are available too. By the way, I ever think from Matthew through Revelation is available if you want. The Spiral Zodiac did a good job, but as you look at the word from the original languages, all it will do is confirm. If you believe the correct theology, theologically correct, all it's going to do is confirm what you believe. If you don't believe right, then you're going to have to just worm around it and run off and forget it, what you studied, or else you're going to have to just give in to it. One or the other. You're either going to reject or you're going to give it. You may want to go ahead and hold on, hold on to your theology and just go. But the Word of God from Hebrew and Greek will change your theology in little places. It'll clean your act up. Having been loved at Hippo by the agency of Kiryu. This Kiryu here, you can put Ho in front of it, or two actually in front of it. The Lord, because we're talking about Je the Jehovah. We're talking about the Creator. Our next class after 2 Thessalonians is going to be the book of Colossians. And what a glorious book that is. This is talking about the Lord of glory, the creator of the heavens and the earth and how he created it and everything. And it's, 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 a, it's a book that holds up Jesus and shows you how beautiful he is. It's like looking at a perfect diamond that has been fastened perfectly without a scratch or anything and looking at it from every angle because that's what the book of Colossians does. It shows you the Lord and his many faceted beauties. By the agency of Jehovah God, the covenant-keeping God, Jehovah. Jehovah means he who shall become. And when the name Jehovah in the Old Testament was used, God was making a covenant with mankind. My wife just uh, painted a picture here a while back. She's going to put it up for sale, and, and I don't want her to really sell it, but she would probably will. <laughs> but it's a picture of a guy out in the ocean, 
and he's, he's, his boat's sinking, and he's out there hanging on like this, and in the cloud, you will, if there's an angel standing up there in a rainbow, a lightest, slightest rainbow. You'd almost miss it if you didn't look close, but the rainbow is in the cloud. Now, what does a rainbow mean? You'll never destroy the earth by That water. God is God's covenant. He said, I'll put my bow in the cloud. That's a sign of God, the covenant of God, the covenant keeping God. This name, this is the covenant keeping God. This is the one that says, I'll save you to the uttermost if you'll just look to me. We need to look to God, and in verses 11 and 12 and, and 10 and 9 and 8 in the previous work we had, we need to trust God to save us and trust God to change us. Because the old way wasn't good enough. The old way was taking us to hell. Now it tells us something about eternity past. Now we jump from time to eternity past. Jehovah became flesh in time. That's his peculiar action here. This is AD zero here. On a domino, or on a domini. The year of our Lord. This is when God became flesh. Isn't that so beautiful? If Jehovah Witnesses just look at that first, or that place in history when Jehovah became flesh. They'd get their theology straight now. <coughs> Hoti. Excuse me. Hilato. Yes. You, you said something that's really um, important to me. You said trust God to save us and trust God to change, change. us. And you are referencing a particular text or scripture. Oh, the other ones before. See, we had it says uh, when I started off tonight, I said in the truth is safety. Outside of the truth are the right. forces of hell itself. Right, right. When God saves us, He saves us. But then we surrender our life to God. We repent of our sins, if you're really saved. And then you hand your life over to God. And you say, here it is, Lord. Here it is. Take it. Use me. And change it. Trust God to save you and trust God to change you. He's not going to change you for the worse. He's going to change you for the better. I was talking to a man today. He said he, hated, he, he was so mad at God in 1996 or 98, something like that. His daughter died of cancer. She suffered and she suffered. And she said he said she was such a good girl. But you know, she died with this terrible cancer. She was in intensive care, suffering horribly for about five weeks. He said, now I look back, and he said, so many of my children and myself and my wife and so many people in the family were drawn to God by her death. They woke up. There was a jar, an atomic bomb of great magnitude changed their lives by this death of this person that, that loved them so much. Yes. I, I don't want to get off the subject. I, I, um, God works in us both to will and to do His good pleasure. Yes. And I don't believe in antinomianism. And I don't believe in salvation by works. Yes. But I definitely believe that there is a moral and ethical standard, and I believe we have to pursue a godly and holy life. If we don't, we're not saved. That's what the Bible teaches. God saves you forever. If you're saved and you really repent of your sin, you're saved forever. You can't lose it. But a saved person acts like a saved person. Peter says the dog is a dog because it goes back to its vomit. The pig, you clean it up. The pig, you clean it up and it will go back and wallow in the mire where it came from. People can make a profession of faith, but this inside has never changed. The outside, for a while, follows the Lord, but there's got to be a change inside. There has to be validity to that profession of faith. You validate that profession of faith. You know that you're saved because your life changes. You don't go back to the things that held you in the clutches of hell before. You can do it, but you can never do it happily. You cannot go back and wallow in that mire if you're a child of God and be happy. Otherwise, where is you it? can't do it. Where is scripture? You're not, yeah, what? Where it says we're whitewashed. 
remember your whitewashed, he called the... Your washed in blood. Well, Jesus talked about it in the parables, didn't he? Right. He talked about the man that cleaned up his house. You know, the demons were cast out. He cleaned up his house. Everything was all fine and swept and everything else. But along come seven demons and, and, and inhabited him and made it worse than ever before. That's what you call self-reformation. He cleaned up himself, but God wasn't there. God wasn't there. He talks about the sower, one fourth soul, and he went out and sowed, and the some seed came up. It says uh, have good ground and, and produced so many, you know, tenfold, twentyfold, hundredfold. Children of God produce fruit, but it says some of them didn't produce fruit at all. Some of them fell on rocky ground. What it meant is shallow ground. Now, the heat of the earth will make things germinate. A seed here. Now, where rocks are close to the earth and ground, shallow ground, the thing will grow up before everything else does. But then, when the hot winds come, they wither and die. Self, salvation. It didn't work. Whether die. And then he said also, the enemy came at night and sowed tares in the, field, in the wheat field. Tares look just like wheat. He said, leave them there. Don't tear them up. Don't go out and dig them up. Just leave them there until the Lord comes. The Lord of the harvest. And then he will pick the good fruit and he will separate the tares. Those are false, those are false professions of faith. A real profession of faith changes people's life. Real profession of faith changes your life. I remember one time that the girl's name was Levana Woolley. I was going to a church in Wasco. Levana Woolley was a song leader. Levana Woolley was a, a, a youth leader. She was a Sunday school teacher and everything else. And one morning she came down this ball into the altar when the invitation was given. She had reformed herself. She said, my thoughts were never good. I had a terrible thought life. And I came down here today and I realized that when I made a profession of faith that I was baptized years ago, that the Lord wasn't in it. But today he's here. He's convicting me. I'm really repenting of my sins today. She was a good person. She was a great church member. But... There was wickedness in her, and she knew that. She lived, she was raised by a, a wonderful mother and a wonderful father. But she came up here, and she was probably 25 years old when she was really saved. Now and then, I had a friend of mine preach a sermon at a, uh, an American Baptist Association, Association meeting up here in California. His name was Martin Cannon. He preached a sermon up there that brought tremendous conviction on the whole congregation of 1,000, 1,500, 2,000 people. I don't know how many people were there. Two or three preachers were saved. Half a dozen deacons were saved. A few preachers' wives. That's quite a deal. Sometimes that happens. Sometimes you, you, there needs to be an awakening. Wake up! Why have you been struggling with things so long? Because you know what I'm saying. You don't know, have to go to church. Social events sometimes. Well, I see people in, in God's churches going to church and drinking and doing everything that they did before in the world. They haven't changed their lives at all. They are in the choirs or they're in Sunday school classes, all kinds of things. But their life is just exactly like it was when they were lost. And they'll tell the same kind of they talk the same way and they tell the thing and they think the same things and they do the same thing. It's a social affair to them. I'm gonna tell you something where true religion comes from inside. True religion changes you. Is that true, brother?
<laughs> That's what the Word teaches. Now let's see. Let's see how long ago. Let's go back in eternity now. Eternity past. Having been loved by the Lord because He picked us out for Himself. He bore us. He carried us. It's more desirio here in Greek. This is a third person singular. Aris indicative middle. Aris tense, punctiliar, action. When did he do it? And who did he do it for? He himself. Middle voice. All right? He picked us out. He himself. The God. Now it tells us here that Jehovah, Jesus Christ, is the God of heaven. That's what we're going to see in the book of Colossians also. The first fruits unto salvation. The first fruit after salvation. The first fruit that you ever produce. That word is ace there. They sense in the limitation of the thought of verbal action. Sanctification is brought about by the inward working of God's Spirit. God changes you from the inside. He changes your outside. He changes your actions from the inside. That's what he says. The God, the first fruit unto salvation in hagiosmo. Hagiosmo. What in the word is hagiosmo? It really means not of earth. You become otherworldly. That's what it means. You become otherworldly. And it's taken and born about, caused by the Spirit of God. When you are lost, you have a spirit in you, and it's the spirit, the Bible says, of disobedience. The word disobedience means unpersuaded. The spirit of unpersuadedness. You know, when you really repent of your sins, you're persuaded that you were lost. There was a man that Apostle Paul was speaking to one time. I can't think of which Felix or Agrippa. I can't remember which one. And he said, Almost, sir, you almost persuaded me to become a Christian. Persuaded. That's the word. Persuaded. When the Lord convicts your heart, you get thoroughly persuaded. You may not surrender yourself Immediately, we surrender bits and pieces of our lives, don't we? It's a constant surrendering through our lives. But you know it's wrong, and you know it's right. And then it says, <clears throat> because of faith, belief, and you can put in the truth. Because a belief of the truth of God. God's word persuades you. It does. It persuades you doctrinally. It persuades you morally. It persuades you intellectually. It persuades you in every one of your senses. Your sense of taste, appetite, your sense of sight, your sense of hearing, your sense of smell, all of the senses, the senses of touch. God is not withholding any good thing from you. He's not. I remember one woman one time. She said, when God saved me, he gave, saved me with all six senses. Mm -hmm. I'll never forget her, brother, sister mine. When God saved me, he saved me from all six senses. Brother Roy Green got up and says, there's a good sermon, boys. Write that one down and remember it. I did for the last 30 years. Because he does. If you're saved, he saves all of your senses. He wants to convert all of those senses. He wants to sanctify all of those senses. Did you ever hear that one before, Brother Roy? Uh, Troy? Sorry. Did I'm you ever hear that one before? I, I was writing it out by, by <laughs> saving all six senses. <laughs> saved with all, by, all six senses were saved. Ace, whole, ekalesa, 
Imas, Dia, Tu, Yungalio, Himal, Ace, Peri Poesa, Dogs Ace, Tu, Kiryu, Himal, Esu, Christu. I gotta look at something. <coughs> because I might have made a mistake in my text here and I didn't I've been gonna look at this thirty times. I'm very thankful that the Lord has let me preach tonight. Not coughing my head off so far. Mm -hmm. God did. If you would like to, in your text there, I omitted something. And it's ace hole, and then you should put Kai in there. Oh, okay. Kai. Mine Have I got it written there? Yeah. Above? Yeah. Okay, Kai. All right, that little word, Kai. Now, the book of Revelation says, the final book of the Bible says, let no man take away or add to the word of God. So I want to make sure here that we got that down there. I don't want to be guilty of that. Because I copied the Bible too, see, as you can see. And you do make mistakes occasionally. And I've gone back and checked myself out. And I made this mistake. I made every mistake that all the all of the... A scriptorians ever made. I copied the, the New Testament all by hand. You have the book of First and Second like those Thessalonians here, right in your hand. I did that, see. That's my handwriting. I copied all of the New Testament by hand. They wrote an inlay here and commentary underneath it. I made a lot of mistakes. I had to go back and check and do those things sometimes. Your eyes would skip or whatever. Where did you copy from? I copied it from the vessel. Text. Nessalala text. Nessalala. Nessalala. It's it's in that. Uh, it's in that. Right? It's already in that. Yeah. The Nessalala. All right. Ace hole. Ek klesen himas dia tu ungalayu himon ace peri poesen doxes tu kirio himon esu Christu. Unto which, because which, relative pronoun, accusing singular there. Look at that word ace there. That little word ace is just like the word eth in Hebrew. There's a word before the direct object in Hebrew, there's an eth in there. All right? It's something like this. Bara, bara, sheath. Elohim. Eth Hashemayim Leeth Haaretz. That's Genesis 1 and 1 in Hebrew. It says, And created God, or in beginnings created God, the heavens, first of all. Eth Hashemayim. Eth. Now, before something is going to be acted upon, just like God created the heavens and the earth, He created you in eternity past. He knew you were wrong. He knew you. And he created you. He created you because he knew that you would be saved. And you, in your own personal volition, that you would accept Christ and you would repent of your sins and you would call upon him. And it says, because which he called ye. All right? Now it says in, in eternity past that he wrote our names in the Lamb's book of life before he ever created anything. That's a long time ago. Now he says in time and space, he calls each one of us. God knew we would respond in this way. He, he atoned for all mankind. All right, that's what you call universal atonement. Not everybody saved, but everybody can be saved. Unto or because which also he called ye by the agency of the gospel. It says back over here he picked us out. 
this is 213 over here, the first part of that verse, that we were loved and we were picked out for himself and we were picked out in eternity past. That's when we were elected to be up to salvation. All right? Now, in space and time, he seeks us with his spirit and he seeks us with the gospel. The Bible says, God's Word says, the writer of the book of Hebrews says, that God preached the gospel unto Abraham. The gospel was the good news of the coming of Jehovah in flesh, that he would live the perfect life that, that was necessary, that he would die, and that he would be crucified, and that he would be resurrected and live forevermore. And redeemed us from our sins. By the agency of the gospel of us, unto Terry Poesin. This is that beautiful word. Like you said a few moments ago, Troy, you believe in that salvation is by grace only. But saved people ought. It's, it's absolutely necessary that saved people act like saved people. It's very important. Unto, here we have that word ace again. Unto the obtainment, the possessing, the peri, peri means around, and then poyo, it means to, to work. When you work at something, you accomplish something, don't you? I've been working for a month and a half on my red house, trying to get it ready. It's getting better now. I mean, it's further along now than it was yesterday. Mm -hmm. I'm working on it. You don't work for your salvation, but you work because God is in you. And you have the the obtainment. Doxas tu kiryu himon esus kursu. What do you work for in this world? What do you work toward in this world? You say you're a Christian. What is the word Christian? Christ's life is very important. That's not blasphemy, people. We need to be Christ's life in our lives. It says that we might obtain the Shekinah glory of Jehovah God, Jesus Christ. That's what it's talking about. The Shekinah glory. Where do you receive, where is the Shekinah glory dwelling today in this administration of God's kingdom? Where does the Shekinah glory dwell? In the God's churches. The Shekinah glory that came upon that church at the day of Pentecost is still in God's churches today. I'm not talking about the emotionalism that's going on in the Christian dump today. I'm talking about the Shekinah glory that leads you in the truth and really serving God with your heart, mind, and soul. Changing lives. Seeing people saved. Teaching them the Word of God. That is the administration of the kingdom that is done by God's churches in the world today. There are a lot of counterfeits out there, aren't there? There are a lot of people that are dealing to, to nothing but the mind of man or nothing but the lives of mankind to make them better people. And sometimes nothing but the emotions of mankind. True God, true churches deal with the triune man all aspects of mankind. Mind, spirit, and soul. Emotion, mind, and morality. A true marriage of those things. That's, that's what God's churches do. Thank you for your attention tonight. What was that uh, earlier you were talking about? First John 5, 19. Oh, 1 John 5 and 7. 1 John 5 and 7. See, I'm kind of disappointed to hear that that uh, shouldn't be in there because that proves the part of the Trinity proof. Well, there's other things. Well, it's not something you use. I've been here trying to use the Job and Witness. They got enough sense to know the manuscript that it wasn't there. I'll read that to you real quick. Yeah, there's others. Yeah, there's a whole lot more. Oh, it's down below. It says about the love, our love, or whatever. Love is love. First John 5 and verse 7. I'll read that to you so you'll know what it is. Uh, if you look at it in the original text, it's 
First John 5 and 7, it says, Hote trace, essen hoi martudion ton tes. That's all it says. Because three, there are the, the ones the witnesses. That's all. But in King James, it says, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, that these three are one. Right. Well, it doesn't really say that in the original text. That's theologically sound. But it's not, it doesn't say that in the Bible. It says that theologically, but it does not say that in this verse. What it says in this verse, it says, because three there are the ones witnessing. Now, what does it mean? It says there are three, three witnessing, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Right. And you can see that through life. Now, some preacher, some time or another, wrote down there and wrote the rest of that in there. Mm. And he used that as an illustration. But that's not part of the original scripture. So just in part. And there are many more of them just like that. Well, God bless you. I hope you enjoyed studying God's Word with me tonight. Uh, come back next week. We're going to have to change our class. If you don't see me here, upstairs in S22, if you go up the elevator, go into the main auditorium balcony, and the first classroom you come to on the right-hand side, just as you come to the balcony old seats. Our old class? No, our old classroom. Yeah. That's what we're going, to, we're going to be there for a few weeks until they get that building over there open because somebody more important than me is taking this classroom over. Oh boy. <laughs> so, anyway, unless we can get 30 people in here, guys, next week, and then we won't be able to go up there because it only holds 20 people. So just go out there and beat the bushes and bring a whole bunch of them in there. So I can't give up this classroom. We, we can't get all of them in that little 20 classroom. You know, one time I had 40 people in there, though. 40? 40 in the 20 classroom. In that small one. In that little old tiny class. Well, that was really a mess. Brother Troy, would you dismiss us in prayer tonight, please, brother? Loving Father, I want to put back. I want to thank thee for that word of truth and for the opportunity to come together to study that truth. That, Lord, we might serve thee, we might praise thee in thought and word and in action. But this we pray in the name of thy Son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. I hope that this class is a meaning a lot to every one of you. I don't know when it's going to be. I'll give that to my wife. I don't know when it. If you don't find me in here, just look up there for me.